Hey, greetings everyone. Uh, welcome to Module 1 of the Green Drone AZ program. Uh, we're super happy you guys could join us today in this virtual environment. I guess like it or not, we're all getting <clears throat> a little more used to that these days. Uh, my name is Justin Ettinger, and I'll be narrating this presentation. Hopefully you guys have had a little bit of an opportunity to check out the Green Drone AZ website, get, a, get to know a little more about the project, uh, who's involved, and why we're why we're doing what we're doing. And if not, that's okay. We're going to cover a lot of that information here in Module 1. So a few topics we'll hit on today. Uh, the USDA Forest Service and our local forest outside of Phoenix here, the Tano National Forest. Conservation. Introduce you guys to the Lower Salt River Restoration Project. We're going to talk about a technology called Geographic Information Systems and how that technology can be implemented in natural resource management. And last, but certainly not least, uh, get to know a little more about why we're turning towards drone technology in this mission. And that's where Green Drone AZ comes in. <clears throat> so since I'm not standing in front of you guys presenting, I thought I'd just give a, you know, a little background information on myself. Again, my name is Justin Ettinger, and uh, I've been with the Forest Service on the Tano National Forest since 2015. Started out as a range technician doing some uh, vegetation utilization studies on cattle grazing allotments and been working as a GIS and natural resource specialist uh, for the last couple years. So if this is the first time you're hearing about the Forest Service in general, uh, I guess we better start with an introduction there. So the USDA Forest Service is a land management agency established by Congress in 1905 under the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. And Roosevelt at the time was among a group of leaders that began to really recognize that there was a need to protect our natural resources from exploitation and protect our watersheds, protect our landscapes in the West. Today, the USDA Forest Service manages about 193 million acres of land, public land. And so that's what we're seeing on this map here. The green areas are going to be your national forest areas and uh, that brown kind of orangish color our national grasslands. <clears throat> so here in the Phoenix area, our, uh, our local national forest is the Tonto National Forest, right in our backyard here, right outside of Mesa. Tonto National Forest was established in 1905 to protect the watersheds of the Salt and Verde Rivers. At that time, in the early 1900s, Phoenix, Mesa, Tempe were, were just agricultural communities, you know, so obviously to grow vegetables and grow produce in the desert, they needed a dependable supply of water. <clears throat> Tano National Forest is a big forest at just under 3 million acres, making it the fifth largest national forest in the United States. Just to clear up a little uh, misconception, I feel like I get a lot out there, and that's that the National Park Service and the Forest Service are two different agencies. So national parks are managed to preserve unimpaired natural and cultural resources, right? And the big difference with the Forest Service is that these are... Uh, public lands that are managed for multiple use. So that means things like timber, recreation, mining, grazing, wildlife, conservation, and hunting. Oftentimes those two go hand in hand. Uh, so, so that big difference of managing the landscape for multiple use, right? You can't go into a national park and just start cutting down a tree for some firewood. You could do that on the forest technically with a permit. <clears throat> But if we start to look at the mission of these two agencies, then we can find some commonality, right? You can pull out words here like sustain and preserve, and this idea of keeping things around for future generations. And that's really what conservation is all about, right? The careful preservation and protection of something. In this sense, planned management of natural resources to prevent their exploitation or destruction. And we can't really talk about conservation without giving our man Gifford Pinchot a, a little shout out here. Considered the grandfather of conservation and really believed that its purpose was to provide the greatest grid to the greatest number of people for the longest time. Right? So this idea that nature matters and we're all drawn to nature. Nature provides resources to us. We can make those resources last for everyone in the long term, but it's going to take some finding common ground and working together. So when we talk about natural resources, we're thinking of things like water, minerals, soil, vegetation. And how about some threats to those resources, right? So think here in the West, first one that 
comes to mind, at least for me, is is wildfire, so natural disasters, and that could be wildfire or hurricane, hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, you know, obviously, climate change is a big hot topic, as it should be. Uh, there's also things like environmental pollution, and this big one on the bottom, which is the human population. If we look at these uh, slides here, the slide two images left and right, on the left we have satellite imagery of Chandler, Arizona, 1972. You can see Chandler at the time, population just over 13,000, that little cluster of a community completely surrounded by agricultural land. Those are those red and green kind of recti rectangle shapes you see. Fast forward to 2019 on the right, same area uh, in this satellite imagery. Well, we can see those agricultural fields have kind of disappeared and, and we're left with that lovely grid design of community that we've come to know. Lots of homes, lots of roads, lots of people, right? So if we're talking about agricultural fields or hundreds of thousands of people surviving in the middle of the desert, the number one resource that we're worrying about here is going to be water. And so here in the, uh, in the Phoenix kind of valley area, we get our water from the Salt River. And that's been the case for hundreds of years. I mean, the Salt River is the reason that the Hohokam were originally able to settle in the valley and, and start with agriculture and develop the first canal systems. Even today, the Salt River still provides 60% of the irrigation and drinking water to the Phoenix metro area. So we can think of the Salt River sort of in three sections. Uh, the Upper Salt River, formed by the confluence of the Black and the White Rivers, flows freely. Uh, until it enters a, a series of reservoirs, starting with Roosevelt Lake, continues through a few of those lakes and hits the Lower Salt River, where eventually it's drained out into the metropolitan area into the canal system. Now, I've been lucky enough to uh, spend a lot of my time working in the last few years on the Salt River and working in what's known as riparian areas. So riparian areas are the interface between the land and a river and, or stream, right? Uh, in the arid southwest, these areas represent a really small percentage of our total land cover. But despite that small size, these areas play a huge role in providing ecological function and value in the desert. And that often starts with a, a diversity of plants, right? So due to this increased availability of water compared to surrounding uplands, uh, riparian areas are full of a diversity of different kinds of plants, right? And that's kind of a snowball effect from there as far as uh, overall biological diversity goes. You have more plants, you're going to have more insects, you're going to have more wildlife species. Uh, for wildlife in particular, riparian areas provide critical habitat, food sources, nesting areas, and travel corridors. Uh, obviously, compared to the surrounding desert, there's big, large trees which create shade in lower temperatures. That's important for both uh, terrestrial and aquatic species. In addition, these areas act as a buffer between waterways and upland areas. In doing so, they reduce sediment runoff, they help to stabilize stream banks, they play a big role in putting nutrients and groundwater back into the system. In doing so, they're filtering out pollutants. Now, despite this importance, native riparian areas are shrinking all over the West. And this isn't anything really new. This has been happening for decades. Uh, from here on in, we're going to kind of zoom into the Lower Salt River, but just keep in mind that the concepts we discuss can be related really to many riparian areas of the Southwest, and especially those uh, that have had dams constructed on them. So if we think about the construction of dams, right, obviously we're altering the natural stream flow of a river. And native plant communities depend on that natural stream flow. Right, so if we think about something like cottonwoods, they like to deposit their seeds on a freshly scoured bank after a big flood event. In addition, there's obviously been a big increase in human population and activity, urban development. We're using up lots and lots of water, depleting the groundwater table. And we've also introduced a number of invasive plant species. And sometimes those were introduced with good intentions. But because these are invasive plants, you know, they're not native to our system they act a lot differently than our native vegetation does. It gives them the ability to be a contributor to ecosystem degradation, right? So our native plants in the desert tend to use nutrients and water pretty slowly. It's a long race, right? It's not a sprint. But these invasive plant species can use nutrients such as water or uh, sunlight way differently. It gives them the ability to outcompete native plant species. 
And in doing so, they can create these expansive monocultures or a big stand of one type of species. And anytime you only have one type of species, that's going to decrease biodiversity, right? In addition, these big dense stands pose a significant wildfire threat. On the Lower Salt River, the two species that we're dealing with the most are uh, tamarisk or salt cedar and actually a, a, gra a grass species called giant reed. So on the right there, you can see giant reed grows to over 25 feet tall. On the left, that's a picture of a really dense stand of tamarisk. So like we said, uh, you know, many times these invasive plant species that we struggle with today were, were introduced with good intentions. And that's definitely the case with tamarisk, uh, introduced in Western North America as an erosion control method. Uh, but due to its ability to, to adapt to drier conditions and, and the combination of those construction of dams and altered stream flows, tamarisk now occupies uh, many areas in, in riparian areas of the Southwest. And so the same can be said for giant reed, again, uh, introduced as a method to control bank erosion in canals in California, uh, quickly outcompetes native, native vegetation for sun and water, can reach heights greater than 20 feet, grows very rapidly, and forms many dense stands along the lower Salt River, some areas extending up to 300 feet inland. When talking about the role invasive plant species can play uh, in altering the behavior of wildfire in the desert southwest. Uh, the cactus fire is a good example. So the cactus fire ignited on the Lower Salt River in, in April of 2017, burned over 818 acres of riparian and sonoran desert habitat, and it really exposed the role that invasive plant species can play in altering that fire behavior. Uh, more and more recently, we're seeing large fires take place in the desert, and uh, the desert plant community didn't really evolve with regularly occurring fire. So if you think about native vegetation in the desert, it kind of exists in these clusters. And oftentimes in between those clusters would be just sort of barren ground, you know, bare ground or rocks. Uh, and lately we've been seeing that the change in fire is because of invasive grass species that are occupying that inner space. This allows fire to carry across a landscape, right, and burn at a greater severity. This is going to negatively affect native vegetation, and in areas that are densely populated, it could be a big public safety threat. So we can see the perimeter here of the cactus fire. Like we said, April 25th, 2017. Uh, so you're looking at the, the 800 acre uh, area here affected by the cactus fire, and it's really right outside of town, surrounded by infrastructure. And following the cactus fire, a three acre restoration study plot was set up on the Lower Salt River with the, control, the goal of controlling tamarisk regeneration, right? And seeing if through removal of that competition, we could get native vegetation to recolonize the area. And we quickly started talking about growing beyond three acres, but that certainly came with some challenges of its own. So looking here, we can see that three acre uh, plot represented by this pink polygon. And uh, those black grids that you see encompass uh, the entirety of the Lower Salt River Recreation Area. It's 11 mile stretch of river and about a 6,600 acre area. So obviously when you talk about managing vegetation on a, on a large piece of land like that, it comes with some challenges, right? And primarily, how do you manage what's on the ground if you're not exactly sure what exists on the ground? So this area, as far as the Forest Service goes, has been managed primarily for recreation. Uh, it sees an incredible amount of recreational use, thousands of visitors every weekend. Uh, so we didn't really have a good grasp of what exactly was happening at a population level uh, with invasive plants along the Lower Salt River. And shortly we'll get to how we used geographic information systems to help answer that question. We decided we'd start with uh, managing invasive plants within the burn scar of the cactus fire. And in 2018, the Lower Salt River Restoration Project was established. So the LSRRP uh, has some of the following objectives. We want to reduce the presence of invasive plants, this tamarisk and giant reed, those two plants that we mentioned uh, within the fire scar, limit the regeneration of tamarisk. In doing so, we hope to increase the native plant abundance reduce the risk of wildfire and improve riparian habitat. And we really want to get the local community involved through stewardship opportunities and engage and educate youth about environmental conservation. So entering our third year, uh, our third phase, uh, which will be fall of 2020, 
uh, we've brought together a large group of people and even gotten local corporations involved. So you can see funding's been provided by Intel and SRP through National Forest Foundation. And uh, funding for the Green Drone OZ project was, was provided by Boeing. <clears throat> In phase one, uh, we treated 70 acres of riparian habitat, planted over 15,000 trees, got a lot of volunteers out there planting trees. It was a great time. Phase two, a little bit bigger of an operation, same management goals. In phase three, uh, like we said, that'll that'll be fall of 2020, and we have an additional 70 acres planned. So through both active and passive restoration methods, we're changing the landscape on the Lower Salt River. So we think about the active method, we're physically removing tamarisk through mechanical and chemical treatment, and we're planting native riparian tree species, right? If we think about the more passive method, we're still physically removing the giant reed, uh, but we're seeing a big return of native tree species. They're recruiting on their own, right? So through that limitation of competition, these native tree species are starting to colonize the area again. And the success that we've experienced on the Lower Salt River Restoration Project is really due to the collaboration that we've built. So we've united federal, state, federal and state agencies, nonprofit organizations, universities, private corporations and hundreds of local community members. And all of this hard work on the ground, you know, wouldn't be possible without this large group of people that are involved. In the next section of the presentation, we're gonna switch gears a little bit though, and uh, get back to talking about the technology that's behind all of this and, and what's helped us with these restoration efforts. So as a GIS specialist, I work a lot with a technology called geographic information systems. And if we break apart those three words, we can get a little clearer picture of what GIS is all about. So geographic, meaning related to something's location on Earth. And we use a known coordinate system to do that. Information is data, right? So this could be population data, income data, or it could be based on objects, uh, such as roads, buildings, rivers, or vegetation, such as on the Lower Salt River. The system is what ties all of this information together and allows us to view this integrated data based on its location on Earth and start to recognize patterns and relationships. So we're gonna kind of stick to the basics today and, and we'll get a little more deeper into GIS technology and future modules. But I wanted you guys to have an understanding of two different data types that we'll be working with, we're talking about here in the next couple of slides. And that's vector data and raster data. So vector data are objects represented by points, lines, and polygons and using that X and Y coordinate system to represent their location on Earth. Raster data, uh, in this sense, is gonna be aerial imagery. And that could be an imagery collected uh, by satellite or via helicopter, or more increasingly so, uh, using drones. And so raster data is a representation of the world divided into a regular grid of cells, right? Commonly, we think we refer to this more as pixels in this, in this picture. So you zoom in really far on a picture, you start to see those squares within it. Each of those squares is a pixel or a cell. And that cell can represent a certain distance or it can represent a value, such as the amount of light reflected from that area. So we use GIS to complete that task of inventorying and mapping plant species across 11 miles of the Lower Salt River. And you guys will do some of these activities in module one, uh, get an idea of kind of the challenges that might, you might face when it comes to inventorying and mapping plant species. But for now, we're gonna walk through sort of how we use GIS throughout the project. And so data management, starting with that data creation, data collection, that is what goes into, you know, inventorying and monitoring using remote sensing, meaning, uh, not physically being on the ground, but collecting this information from say a computer and project management, right? So a lot goes into the planning of these large scale projects and GIS is used to track uh, progress, record areas that have been treated, monitor the success of our management actions, right? Really it all started with creating data and that's the beauty in GIS is it gives you the ability to create your, and design your own data. 
what do you want to collect and what features are important to the project that you're working on, right? So with GIS, that starts with the geo database. It's kind of like the library that houses all of our data. And the features would be sort of like the books inside of that library, right? So in this case, our geo database was used to uh, inventory and map plant species on the Lower Salt River. And so the features inside of that are related to things like invasive plant populations, native plant populations, restoration treatments, and certain project areas within uh, the, the area that we're working on the Lower Salt River. From the book level, we get down to the chapters, right? And that's sort of the attributes that we're recording. So again, we can create everything that we need to answer the questions we're looking at. So on the right side, you see uh, the individual attributes that are collected for each uh, plant population that we're recording. So things like the common name, a scientific name, what kind of vegetation community it exists in, what's the overall size, uh, what is the date it was collected on, what's our management objective with this plant species. All of these attributes can be collected in the field so that as we go in, all of that data helps us in planning, right? So we kind of mentioned earlier this challenge of not knowing exactly what was on the ground, right? And it was a little bit daunting to consider trying to inventory uh, a 6,602 acre area. We needed a way to break it up into manageable chunks. So I designed this grid uh, that broke up the 11 miles of the Lower Salt River into 46 individually labeled grids. Each of those grids could then be surveyed in a few hours and just use that day after day to map and inventory plant species across the 11 miles of the lower salt. And now data collection can take place in a number of forms. We'll talk about two, on-site on -site observation and off-site observation, right? So let's start with on-site, collecting field data. So I use Collector for ArcGIS, which is a mobile data collection app that you can have on your phone, tablet, uh, and it uses the GPS or satellites and satellites on those devices to estimate your location on Earth, right? And using the project grid, we could systematically survey areas across the Lower Salt River and map and inventory these plant species. So vector data here, right? We talked about point data. Point data represented single plant occurrences. And I can drop that point using Collector for ArcGIS on my phone or tablet, and it'll drop a point in that area that I'm at, and I can then record those attributes. I also use geotagged photographs, meaning that there's a GPS inside my camera, which records those lat and long coordinates of where the image was taken. I can then bring them into GIS as a point with a photo as the attachment. So I can look at that point and estimate its location and know exactly what was going on the ground there, right? And then those points representing single plant occurrences were used to digitize polygon data representing plant populations. So from the left to right here, you can see the original points recorded in the field, the digitized polygon that took place. And on the right, the overall product is polygons representing vegetation plant populations on the landscape. And that off-site observation uh, takes place through a method known as remote sensing. And it's not really that the, if you look at the data collection process as a whole, it's either on-site or off-site, but more so a combination of the two. So remote sensing is the acquisition of information about an object or phenomenon without making physical contact with that object, right? So in contrast to the on-site being on the ground and in the field, we're doing this from the computer using aerial imagery. And so once I have a good idea of what's going on on the ground and uh, drop some points for reference, then I can use remote sensing to digitize these polygons representing different plant species. So on the left here, you see aerial imagery, and on the right, you see the digital, the digitized polygons. And, and in this image, particularly, orange is representing uh, a veget native vegetation known as mesquite bosques. Uh, purple is that tamarisk tree that we talked about. And those blue polygons are populations of cottonwood trees. So the overall product of this digitiz digitization was, of course, vegetation communities mapped across the full 11 mile project area of the Lower Salt River. It gave us the ability to quantify invasive plant populations by acreage, which get, makes planning for the restoration of those species or those areas a tangible experience. 
So the overall results from the initial inventory done in uh, 2018, you can see here. And on the right, we have a table of all of the plant populations and acres mapped. And really our goal would be to reduce those that acreage of tamarisk and giant reed and increase the acreage of uh, those native species on the bottom, such as cottonwood willow galleries and mesquite bosques. In addition to the inventory, uh, an initial management objectives report was generated, and that really detailed the location and extents of invasive plant populations, access to these areas, possible treatment options, proposed six uh, management areas that were sort of the worst of the worst or the best of the best, you know, where, where invasive plant populations were really bad or where there were native plants that we wanted to try and give a little booster shot and help sustain. GIS has been used throughout the project to monitor our management actions and the response that these vegetation species are having. So daily during the field season, GIS is used to track treated areas uh, and give us an overall acreage at the end of the field season, you know, and keep track of the areas that have been treated, what treatment types have taken place there, uh, where we've planted native tree species. And ultimately, as we continue to do this, this, this type of monitoring and these this quantification of acres helps go into the future planning and generate cost estimates as we're providing for proposals for future grants. All right, so we've kind of covered uh, how we've been using GIS within the Lower Salt River Restoration Project site. And we've uh, talked about, you know, different forms of data collection, whether it be in the field or using remote sensing. <clears throat> and these are great tools, uh, you know, that are, that are available to natural resource managers now, and they greatly increase uh, the efficiency of something like, you know, uh, plant mapping and inventory, whereas before GIS, you had to do this basically by hand with a hand-drawn map. <clears throat> but as great as those things are, of course, they can always be improved, right? So it's still very time-consuming to do this kind of work out on the ground. We're dealing with limitations of resolution, both in spatial and a temporal scale. So uh, the spatial resolution refers to the pixel size of an image or of data. So if you think about uh, satellite imagery, let's say, uh, each of those pixels in that grid that we discussed in vector data uh, represents roughly 30 meters on the ground. So that's spatial resolution, right? how defined, how accurate is your resolution spatially. Temporal resolution refers to when that data is being collected. So if it's satellite imagery, you might, uh, that refers to how many times that satellite's going around the planet, right? And when is it snapping a shot at the same portion of landscape that you're looking at? Satellite imagery, that could be days, weeks, months, uh, different forms of aerial imagery. Uh, you see on the list here, NAEP. National Agricultural Imagery Program is recorded uh, via airplane, and the Forest Service gets gets that information about every two years. Uh, but the problem with that is it's it's higher spatial resolution than satellite imagery, right? So NAEP spatial resolution has about one meter, meaning each pixel on the ground represents each pixel in the image represents one meter on the ground. But that limited temporal resolution means that by the time we access that information, it's almost a year old. And this kind of data collection is also subject to human error, right? So if I'm out on the ground and I drop a point, maybe I'm hot and tired that day and I record the wrong plant species, <clears throat> whatever I have from that day on the ground is probably what's going to go forward, right? There's no chance to really, unless I go back out there and look at that same point, that error is likely to carry over. And these forms of um, whether they be field data or remote sensing, they're often good for large-scale mapping and inventory, right? Especially with that limited spatial resolution. But we want to look at small scale, meaning on specific to our project site, 30 meter resolution isn't going to cut it anymore because we want to be able to track vegetation change year after year. So the reason that we're going towards implementing drone or unmanned aerial vehicle UAV technology is because it gives us the ability to improve on some of these problem areas. Rapid deployment, right? We can put the drone up in the air on any given day and collect data and know exactly what's happening on the landscape that day. It significantly reduces the data collection time. So instead of taking hours to uh, 
inventory an area on the ground, we can fly that in a short, you know, in a few flights with a drone. Highly accurate spatial resolution. So we talked about that one meter or 30 meter resolution, depending on what your source is from. With a drone, our spatial resolution is up to three centimeters, meaning every pixel in the image equals three centimeters on the ground. <clears throat> so we can really track, track that small scale change in vegetation populations. The data can be collected on a temporal scale that's beneficial to us, right? We don't have to wait till we can get access to satellite or aerial imagery. Like I said, we can fly the drone any given day. We can use this to help plant, uh, to map different plant species by determining uh, what kind of cycle the plant is during a certain time of year. Maybe it's flowering and it's going to be really easy to pick up that kind of plant because it has bright yellow flowers during this time of month. <clears throat> Data and analysis is easily accessed and it's repeatable, right? We can return to this data compared to that subject to human error where I said, well, we have to go back out to the field and map that exact plant. Uh, using drone imagery, we have a, a, a data source that's easy to return to. It can be analyzed and accessed over and over. It's really good for this small scale mapping and inventory, what we're looking to do on the project site. You know, we're not looking at uh, this large landscape across the whole state of the Arizona of Arizona we are looking at 200 acres on our project site and we want to be able to track change there <clears throat> so we'll kind of just wrap up with where we started right green drone AZ and and hopefully you guys have got a little better understanding as to why we're we're looking to incorporate drone monitoring into this project and that's to collect data to help inform our decisions, right, and our management actions. And while doing so, we really are excited about engaging local high school students and training them in the use of technologies such as drones and geographic information systems, and maybe sparking an interest in bringing that technology and those skills to the field of natural resource management. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future modules. Take care.